Hello and welcome to this ET Now special. Uh, my guest today is one of India's finest CEOs and a darling of the stock markets given the wealth that he's created for investors. Uh, Aditya Puri, always a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you for talking to ET Now. Uh, you. You're doing a fine job of running HDFC Bank, so I don't have too many questions on HDFC Bank. Let's first talk about the elephant in the room, the NPA crisis. And uh, a, a series of steps have been taken by the government and the RBI over the last fortnight or so to fix the problem. Structurally, do you believe this is enough to fix the problem? I think so. I think the way they've uh, gone about it is quite systematic. If you see the issues that had come about it, one thing you have to r recognize about NPA, the longer they remain, the tougher they are to resolve. That is one part. The other issue was if there is any haircut needed, who will take the decision because then you could have re repercussions. The third is whether all bankers agreed with it. The fourth is did we have the appropriate legal mechanism. Five is if any prodding was needed, who was supposed to give it. So I think between the oversight committee, between the NPA ordinance, between the powers to the RBI and the Bankruptcy Act, I think there's the best chance we have of resolving it. What it does is it puts a time frame. So you don't resolve it, then RBI comes in. You still can't resolve it. You go to the bankruptcy court. You can't resolve it and come out with a Chapter 11 kind of decision there. Then it goes into liquidation. Mm -hmm. Now, bulk of the ba bad loans are concentrated around 40 to 50 uh, companies. D do you think the system will have to opt for some sort of radical haircut? And with this ordinance now, is there enough comfort for banks to take that haircut? I think, le le let's, uh, uh, let me step back a bit. So if you look at it, haircut is a given. Because these are NPAs not of today. These are long-standing st NPAs. And the longer you don't resolve the NPA, the bigger the haircut. So is there, is there going to be a haircut? Definitely. But there is economic value there as well. So the difference between the economic value that exists and the value that is there in the books will obviously have to be taken as a hit. And there is no way out. So this is the best possible mechanism, as I said previously, whereby you professionally move and take whatever is necessary, put it behind you and go ahead. Mm. Now the overall bad loans in the system adds up to what about 9 lakh crore rupees every day. The number keeps getting even more alarming. Realistically, how much of this do you think can get fixed in the next one year? You spoke about time frame. What is your own assessment? How much could get fixed in the, in the next one year or so? See, firstly, I don't uh, reckon, uh, understand this bad loan uh, figure. NPA doesn't mean the loan is bad. bad. Second is that total figure does not take into account the security the banks hold as well as the provisioning. Sure. The Indian banking system on an average has a security cover of around 60%. Uh, sorry, a provisioning cover of about 60%. And they have good security. So that 9 lakh figure would probably... Uh, Look a lot smaller. <laughs> ...would be a lot uh, smaller. Then you have NPAs of two types, and I think you alluded to that. They, one is the NPA that has been there for a period of time. And one is an NPA created by circumstances where the GDP is now lower than what it was expected to be. Those can be resolved, and I think those will be resolved within the next one year or so. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, A.M. Nayak spoke to E.T. now the day this ordinance was passed, and he, was, he said that he believes only one-third of these so-called NPAs are likely to be resolved. Uh, uh, are you as sort of pessimistic, or do you think, you know, more bad loans could turn? I won't comment on what Mr. Nayak said, but mm -hmm. as I said, that if you look at it, there, there are loans which a large portion of these loans can be resolved which have not been chronic and have, so if you resolve a loan in the early stages it can be resolved. I would think that is an overly pessimistic assessment. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the, the other aspect of this new NP ordinance is the role of the central bank. The regulator giving directives to banks in certain situations, like you pointed out, uh, in specific cases. Do you think that's a desirable situation, or do you think commercial decisions should be best left to banks? Because that's been one of the criticisms of this ordinance. Commercial decisions should be best left to banks if they take the decisions. Mm -hmm. The problem has been that those decisions have not been taken for a variety of and I'm not trying to criticize anybody. For a variety of reasons, those decisions have not been taken. Whether it is the quantum or the haircut, whether who will be held accountable, whether banks all agree. And I think in these circumstances, RBI giving a bit of a nudge on a professional basis is very welcome. Sure. Uh, you know, we all know what got us here. And as I said, you know, I don't want to waste time talking about the legacy issues that led to this situation in the first place. Don't want to do a blame game. But on hindsight, 
Do you believe that you know banks have been soft on on large corporates? I know the media obsesses with one case, which is the Vijay Mallya episode, but there are a whole host of large corporates, large conglomerates, and one gets the feeling that they've gotten away too easily. Would you agree with that assessment? And this is for the banking system as a whole. I'm not talking about HDFC Bank. You must recognize that I do not have too absolutely, much expertise absolutely. on the subject. So no, that's you don't have too much of exposure to the problem, but yes. Uh, and wherever uh, we have found that we have to take hard decisions, we've taken it and we've let the promoter know our views. For the rest of the banking system, I think it's better if you get a uh, comment from somebody more uh, acquainted with it. Okay, you're, you're sort of playing it with a straight back. But uh, I'm going to try my luck with another question, which yeah. is the RBI has now asked banks to report divergence in sort of NPA recognition, uh, and we've seen a large private lender having had to report a significant divergence in NPA recognition. Is that a problem that you're worried about? Because this also raises, you know, questions on uh, on, on credibility of, of private banks and whether, you know, we are masking some of the NPA problems at a global level, like, you know, people expect Chinese banks to do. Is that a serious concern, according to you, for the system as a whole? two parts. There could be a timing concern. There cannot be any other concern. So the issue is the following. For instance, we, just to make it clear, we did not have a divergence. So largely you would agree. There is a logistical stroke timing issue, which is technical in the sense that the RBI inspection will happen uh, after your accounts have been uh, uh, published or thereabouts. And at that point in time, it, there could be genuine differences. Mm -hmm. So should there be a divergence between the central bank and the bank? No. The uh, only point is whether you should put, uh, go backwards or resolve it in the uh, quarter that you get uh, uh, the, uh, the RBI report. And my view is you should resolve it in the quarter that you get it. Mm -hmm. Going back, unless it's something that genuinely there was no kind of difference of opinion, it's something that you should have done and you didn't do, then, well, then you should be hit for it. But otherwise, if there's a genuine difference of opinion, uh, the regulator still prevails. And going backwards, I think we need to find a better solution. Sure. Uh, last word on, on NPA. So would it be fair to say that you believe the worst is behind us as far as the NPA problem for the economy as a whole is concerned? Because that's been the big drag, the one reason why you know investment cycle hasn't turned, we aren't growing as well as we could. Is, is the worst behind us? The worst is behind us. For the system as a whole? Yes. All right. Moving away from NPA, and this is sort of a topical issue, and there's been criticism that's come in uh, from the chief economic advisor that banks sort of bend backwards to please the regulator and uh, you know and the finance ministry, and there isn't enough constructive criticism, uh, whether it's a monetary policy or a fiscal policy. Uh, you know, what would you say to that? I haven't seen what you said, mm -hmm. so without referring to what you said, let me say I am not scared of anybody. Mm -hmm. I will express my professional opinion, and let me express it so that it's very clear. I think the RBI has done a good job in ba in managing the interest rate scenario, recognizing. Uh, the, the conflict between inflation and growth, I think they've done a good job. I think they've done a good job in managing the uh, foreign exchange in a volatile global environment. I don't see any necessity to criticize them on the subject. Sometimes a lot of criticism comes in because I think this transmission, we keep saying it, uh, the media doesn't want to recognize it, we keep saying it, that there is not a one-to-one -one correlation that if the RBI reduces the repo rate today, I can reduce it tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. That's an indication. The MCLR mechanism, which is a professional mechanism recognized in educational institutes as well as all, all over the world, is that when my deposit rates come down, I am obligated to bring down my base lending rate. Mm -hmm. And I think that works. And so if you expect instant transmission, that's not going to be there. Transmission over the longer run will be there. And nor is it going to be one-to-one -one because we have SLR, CRR, etc. And the market where demand and supply for money to take care of. And they are competing uh, organizations like now in this new world. So there's the mutual fund, there's small savings, etc., etc. So I think the, uh, the transmission can take a little longer. That said, I think on demonetization and the money that came in, the banks went out of their way to reduce rates disproportionately because we didn't know how much of the money would remain. Sure. So I hope I've clarified the issue, yeah, but and I can assure you I'm not scared of anyone because I don't, I'm not looking for anything. Yeah, sure, but you know, to quote, to quote the chief economic advisor, he says bankers are worried not to get in the wrong side of the government or the RBI because they worry about losing access. Is that true? And I just want to He's ask not you, talking about me. 
<laughs> I have never worried about access. I have not had a problem with access. And I can tell you that for this government as a whole. Mm -hmm. You go in with a valid uh, point that you need to discuss, you will get access. Mm -hmm. So are you implying that specialized access on a side basis? I think neither the government wants it, nor are we looking for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but access where it's necessary in the interest of the country or the banking system is available. Yeah, but so just one last point, which is the reason I think the media also has this perception that corporates are a little sort of scared to criticize the government and the RBI. And, and if the chief economic advisor also thinks so, I think that's the reason I'm asking this question. I, is there this sort of fear that, you know, that people need to be conscious of how they, you know, criticize the government or the central bank? Uh, and is there enough constructive criticism that you see in the economy? I am not aware of such fear, at least I am not scared. So the rest, whoever feels this, I think you better interview them as to... Sure, fair enough. Uh, now that Corporate India has a license to criticize uh, as given by the Central uh, Chief Economic Advisor, tell us, is, is the tight monetary policy here to stay for a while? I mean, where are the rates headed and, and do you think now there's a case for... I know you don't usually comment on monetary policy and... Prime no, after and the fact, I'm not commenting on policy, but the situation I'm happy to comment on. Huh, so, so where do you so think... So firstly, where headed? is the tight monetary policy? The, the system is surplus by 3 lakh crores. Sure. There is excess liquidity. Where is the tight monetary policy? But shouldn't the central bank move its stance from being neutral to accommodative? Why? To send a signal because inflation is now the very much... The signal is there. So neutral doesn't mean that uh, he is saying that uh, all he had said last time is I have to watch mm -hmm. the CPI and the WPI mm -hmm. as to where it's going. So do you see scope for, uh, for rates to come down? Depends on how inflation goes. I see scope for it to come down. I see scope for it to go up. But given where inflation if is the, right now, I if, mean, in, if inflation is where it is right now, but if demand picks up substantially, mm -hmm. you could see, uh, and the liquidity in the market disappears, you could see a marginal pressure. Mm -hmm. But either way, just to put everything at rest, I don't see more than a 25 basis points either way. So is that earth shaking? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. So which brings me to the question on how industry sort of keeps on blaming. Uh, you know, uh, the system uh, for slowdown investment saying that rates aren't sort of haven't come down enough. Is that criticism valid at all, you think? I think the industry has been saying this for a while, and we bankers have been saying if your project is going to be either you are going to go in for a project or not go in because of a 1% difference in interest rate, I think you need to examine your project appraisal again. Let's talk about three years of this government because, uh, you know, the government is completing three years. Uh, in, in, a, in, in about a week or 10 days from now, uh, uh, and the markets are at an all-time high, almost as if it's you know, symbolic of what's happened over the last three years. But, Mr. Puri, tell, tell me, do you think that the euphoria is backed by fundamentals? Now, normally euphoria should be backed by fundamentals, but let me give you my view as to what I see has happened in the last three years. So if you see, we have a very clear, the, the government has a very clear fiscal policy in terms of the fiscal deficit, the composition of expenditure between capital and uh, revenue, the allocation to the states, wanting to expand the tax net so that they can uh, get leeway to spend, so whether it's the GST or it is uh, uh, demonetization coming up with the NPA and the uh, bankruptcy code so that there is speedy resolution, I think is a very good policy. One could argue that our macros haven't been, test, haven't been tested. You know, it can't be too tough to manage your twin deficits when crude is at fifty dollars a barrel. I mean, you know, three years back, four years back, it was at one hundred and thirty, one hundred forty dollars a barrel. Good man, I like you. So, so it can't be too tough. Are to you manage saying it's deficit. not tested? Two droughts don't test it. Global slowdown doesn't test it. But global slowdown has been there for a while. No, no, global slowdown has been a while, but three years also, three years of a global slowdown and two droughts. As per our local economists, the drop in oil prices compared to this. There's a 25 basis point negative impact, so it has been tested. Now, let me uh, go forward. If you see glo globally today, you're talking about population reducing, you're talking about deleveraging, you're talking about uh, deglobalization. In that environment, India is actually very well positioned. And because of that, you have the euphoria. Nobody puts, I mean, don't think the FIIs or the FDIs or the market, the market, sub janta hai. It may be a timing difference, but they all know. So euphoria, euphoria doesn't come. They can be ups and downs. But I haven't seen a report that doesn't say, given the current global environment and the policies in place, India doesn't have a bright future.
Right. So you, you spoke, you know, I want to talk about demonetization because you were one of the few who openly came out in support of this policy when a lot of your peers were sort of not sure what impact it would have. But tell me, Mr. Puri, do you think the six months after the rollout of this policy, has it achieved what it set out to achieve? The core objectives with which this policy was introduced, has it achieved what it set out to achieve in your view? I think it's achieved a lot. I, I, I haven't examined it with the, with the core, core objective, but le let me uh, go, go through what I think it has achieved. Very definitely, it's brought more money into the system. It's brought down interest rates. It will definitely widen the tax net by the time that uh, income tax people are finished with all the people who deposited money, which is really not white money. They would, uh, that will come back, and so it will widen the tax net. It has led to a great push on digitization, which will help in financial inclusion, which will help in transparency, uh, which will help in, I was with McKinsey yesterday, which will help in uh, bringing down corruption, because that's the only way when you, when you really digitize the application process, the response process, the payment process, the health care. So I think... Uh, Overall, I, th I, I, I think the fears in terms of uh, including yours, in terms of a tremendous decline in GDP have not been there. Let's push, push it aside. Yes, did, well, did some people suffer? There's no gain saying that. But net-net, do I think it was positive? I think so. Yeah, let me quote Kaushik Basu, former chief economic yes. advisor, one of the finest economists, who says we've lost 1.5% of GDP growth uh, due to demortization. We could have grown at 8.5%. Well, if Mr. Basu can get us to grow an eight and a half percent without demonetization, I'll make him king of India. <laughs> so, can we state it on facts? I don't think uh, we were moving towards eight and a half percent. And that brings me to the point that seven to eight percent is very good growth in today's global environment, the way it's going. If we reach eight and a half percent, it would be a miracle, which I hope for. Uh, if we get everything right, we could hit it. But uh, I don't think demonetization has been the cause of our long-term uh, prospects being hit. Sure. Uh, I, uh, the economic advisor, only you're keeping on quoting here. <laughs> They're the only ones who are making provocative statements. Yeah. Uh, on the core issue of job creation, Mr. Puri, because that's been a concern, you know, one of the promises in which this government came to power to create jobs. And that has been a challenge uh, because of the environment we are in, because of slowdown in manufacturing. Uh, you see the new jobs created vis-a-vis -vis what it was in, say, 2012-2011. The trend is visibly sort of sharply lower. That could also be a function of the global environment that we are in. How big a concern is that? And now we're obviously seeing more layoffs in sectors like IT and manufacturing. How worried are you on account of that? I think that's a cause of worry. You, uh, everybody should be worried. So am I. Because we've got the demographic dividend coming our way, and if we handle it right, and that's one of the issues, if we handle it right, then we will buck the global trend of uh, depopulation. Mm -hmm. And whenever you have population, then you create demand, you can manufacture, etc. Uh, have we done enough, and have we tried? Yes. The, I have the circumstances, you know, uh, when you have technology changing, when you have technology in large corporates. But if the strategy on health rural employment, microfinance, sustainability, uh, infrastructure, uh, food processing works out, which they're working very hard on, I think we have more than a reasonable chance of success. But is it a cause of concern which requires tremendous effort? The answer would have to be yes. Mm -hmm. uh, to look at it differently, you know, IT sector, for example, I want to talk specifically about IT sector because it's, it's, in, it's in the news on account of the recent layoffs that multiple companies have sort of had to undertake. Now, it's been one of the biggest drivers of the Indian consumption story, you know, the, the, in terms of spending and borrowing to buy homes and cars and whatnot. And it's this EMI bracket, so to say, that has now been hit hard. And, and a lot of the growth in the retail side for banks like yours has also been driven by this sort of, you know, burgeoning middle class, so to say, these IT professionals who sort of get, you know, high salaries and who've been taking loans and all that. And, and a lot of them now getting retrenched or, you know, them being laid off uh, and, you know, there's not easy jobs available to get as well. Is that a concern? Is that a social concern as well? Are we staring at a crisis in terms of defaults, in terms of borrowing, lower borrowing? Are job losses going to be the next big sort of, you know, crisis that we're staring at? Staring at? Firstly, you like the tech guys, I think, are giving too much importance to technology. So what are the total job losses we are talking about? But we are a country of a little over a billion. Sure. So what are the total job losses? I agree, but symbolically, when agree. every first company is... It will be 20,000. Say 20,000, 20,000. Won't even sniff about it in the morning. But uh, while we were talking about Make in India, I covered it for you, hmm. that now these may not be the new job creators. They will not be. But I was talking to Rajesh from TCS also day before. 
what is what we are having to move from a direct linear correlation between number of people employed and the revenue is we will have to move up the value chain which, which is necessary in all organizations. It's happening in financial services. It will happen there. But whereas IT did define us, it did create a brand, but if you're saying they were a major component of either GDP or employment, I disagree with that. So that cannot be the crisis. That said, the issue, yes, is that you are getting growth as of now without too much job creation. And that is a cause of concern. And I think they're working very hard trying to get uh, the small scale industry is going, trying to get, uh, you take for instance us. We are looking at having 10 million women, women uh, family, self-sustaining a family. That's 40 million people. Now that's, and I think the scope for uh, sustainable livelihood could go up to 200 million people if a lot of people concentrated on it. That's a lot of jobs. So there are jobs in the semi-urban and rural area. There they are being created. There are some jobs which are being lost. But then you look at all the small, uh, emphasis on small scale, etc. And as you bring the roads, power, electricity to semi-urban and rural uh, and, and change the uh, supply chain, I think it's a cause for concern. It's not a cause for alarm. And we all have to work very hard. What about the impact of automation on jobs in the banking sector? HDFC Bank has a humanoid to help customers with banking transactions. And yes. You've made sort of rapid strides uh, with things like that. But on a broader level, what sort of impact will this sort of an automation have on jobs in the financial services sector? It will, uh, as with everybody else, the, it's not that the jobs are going to disappear. So if the job about somebody answering queries, uh, where do I go for uh, putting my fixed deposit, what is my balance, et cetera, et cetera, if those jobs go away, you will have jobs in analytics, you will have jobs in changing processes, you will have jobs in sales, you will have jobs in marketing, you will have jobs in credit. So the composition of jobs will change. But that doesn't take away from the concern that, yes, job creation is a concern. I, I appreciate your honesty on that front. Uh, on investment cycles, Mr. Puri, you sound so optimistic. You know, Economic Times is a survey today of CEOs, 57 CEOs, and they all sound so bullish. But why don't corporates put their money where their mouth is? You know, why hasn't the investment cycle turned? The investment cycle will turn when demand exceeds supply. And so we had put in a lot of capacity. I do believe that as we move closer and closer to the 7.5, 7.7, 7.8 uh, private investment will come in. Prior to that, nobody money is dear to everybody. So nobody puts in money unless he th thinks he can get enough return. Two questions on HDFC Bank, Mr. Puri. FY17 Finally. Solved. Finally. Yeah. FY17 solved. I, I told you, you're doing a fine job of running the bank. I don't okay. see need for you to say that the best... Uh, the only reason come. I'm giving you the interview is if I can sell the bank. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Uh, so, so FY17 saw loan book growth slipping to below 20% uh, versus several years of growth of around 24, 25, uh, 21 to 27%. Is below 20% loan book growth the new normal or do you think with, as the economy picks up and you yourself sound very optimistic, you could go back to that level? First point is that my domestic growth was actually 23.7%. True. So you didn't analyze it properly or you were just <laughs> trying to pinprick me. So the reason it came down below 20% is because the uh, growth on the base, which includes the FCNR, that FCNR, if you take it away, we actually are having a roaring quarter. On profit growth, again, for several years, you sort of led the way with greater than 30% growth. And then, of course, now... Uh, this 30% is, doesn't is, go away I from know, your head. Now, let me explain but, this to you. No, but just one question. Uh, yeah. which is that so, so, so obviously, in FY17, it dropped to 18%. Mm. Uh, is below 20% profit growth the new normal, or are you looking at, or do you think, you know... Uh, with See, the I don't give guidance. First, first, let me tell you. No, your estimation of the new normal is incorrect. Okay. So that's that answers uh, my question to some extent. Uh, to a complete extent. I do presume that banks do not operate in a vacuum. They operate in a GDP environment. 30% mm -hmm. was when GDP was 8.5%. Mm -hmm. To expect 30% at 7% does not in any way mean that the dynamics of HDFC Bank has changed. Sure. We will do, our growth will be a multiplier of the GDP. Mm -hmm. So when we reach 8.5% growth rate, you could see that same, but within that, I do believe that 18% was an aberration. 
Mm -hmm. I'm not going to give you guidance into the future, but we did 23 point or whatever in the fourth quarter, mm -hmm. and we're looking at uh, a very bright future. So 18 percent was an aberration. Yes, that's, that that's is something correct. that the market would yes. like to take note of. A few more questions before I wrap up. One is on shareholding of HDFC Limited in HDFC Bank, and the reason I ask is that this is an issue that there's been some back and forth on, and and FIs love your stock, and right now there's limited headroom for them to buy because of HDFC Limited's ownership being classified as a, uh, as foreign holding. Uh, in your conversation with Panas Mishri, have you got a feeling that it's something that they're going to consider at some stage? What's the sense you've had? Well, you always live on hope. So in my conversation with RBI and the Finance Ministry, I, I, I believe there's something. Uh, they do say they're willing to consider it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we are requesting them to consider it. But fundamentally, I do believe that if HDFC investment in HDFC life is local, how can HDFC's investment in the bank be foreign? And I also believe that for determining downstream investment, it should be both ownership and control rather than only ownership because FIIs, by definition, do not run a business. They come in as investors. Mm -hmm. So it's something like what happened in the airline, I hope will happen in the banks as well, that you can put a limit on FDI investment. So you can have 100% ownership, uh, foreign ownership in a bank, but the FDI should not exceed maybe, say, 26%. Mm -hmm. And the FIIs, based on uh, SEBI regulations, actually cannot act in concert. Sure. Uh, two questions on digital, because I know that's something very close to you. You sort of made a few trips to Silicon Valley, one recently as well, I'm told, to understand the future of payments and financial system. What's your own take on how this is going to evolve in India? Is there space for multiple models to take off, you think? See, if you look at the uh, payments, Payment is only one, one part of the total uh, financial services infrastructure. So what is required is that people or the consumers should have a convenient and reasonable method to make payments. I think most of the large banks are actually large payment banks by definition. And the charges, despite everything that you come up with, on payments and transfers are probably the lowest in the world and are so low that anybody trying to break into this space is not going to make money. He is going to lose money. But is there space for a payment bank? Yes. Is there space for a regular bank? Yes. Is there space for a small bank? Yes. Is there a place for somebody wanting to ride on the banking system for free? No. Has this digital transformation con you know, convinced you to buy a mobile phone finally or not yet? Now see, that is the other part that I've been <laughs> trying to convince everybody that mobile phone has nothing to do with digital. Hmm. So I, am I able to uh, work without a mobile phone? The answer is yes. At the same time, I'm, am I able to conceive where technology is going by ensuring that my customer needs are met and making sure we use available technology to provide convenience, easy access, best product, best price? I think yes. Always a pleasure chatting with you, Mr. Puri. Thank you so much for the time. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.